If you would, go ahead and open your Bibles up to Galatians chapter 5. We'll be there for a good bit of the morning, not just there, but, but mostly. And I just want to welcome you in and remind you that we're in the middle of a series called Breaking Free, where we're spending six weeks looking at God's Word and what it says about how we break free from the power and the pain of sin through Jesus Christ. And just as a reminder, in week one, one of the first things that we tried to establish that I want to remind you of, of that this series about how to break free from the sin in your life is not for your friend. It's for you. So in case you forgot between week one and week three, I want to remind you again this morning that what we're talking about is not just a series for those who are drug addicts, but it's for every single person in this room as all of us are daily affected by sin and its consequences. And just by way of review as well, in week one, we talked about the beginning point, the starting point to break free is to admit, to admit that in and of ourselves that we are powerless to overcome our brokenness, our addictions, and our struggle with sin in our life, and then moving forward to believe that God is indeed who he says he is, that he is the one who is powerful to enable us to break free from that power and pain of sin, and then to make the move from the head to the heart, the 18 inches that moves us from knowing these things about God to actually trusting him and beginning to trust that following God's plan and walking in a relationship with him is gonna be that which ultimately leads to freedom in our life. That was week one. And then week two last week, you got to hear from another one of our elders, Graham Robbins, as he taught through the principle of confession and how through confession we hit the beginning stages of breaking free and through confession finding healing. And you got to hear his story of how that initially came to be in his life and something that he practices still every single day. But I've got news for you. As, as moving as last week may have been for you and as powerful as it may have been to spur you on to be and to confess things in your life or to continue to confess things in your life, if you stop at confession, the freedom from the power and pain of sin in your life will only be temporary. Some of you last week may have practiced confession of some things for the first time in your life. Or maybe you confessed in a deeper and more authentic way and, and, and there was likely a burden lifted. But if you stop there, the freedom that you're looking for will not be found in any lasting way because lasting freedom requires something else. It requires change. It requires that you make practical, functional changes in your life in both the level of the mind and the level of the heart and the level of the actions in your life. And so this morning, as we continue this series, we're going to be looking at breaking through free through change. And quite frankly, this topic of finding freedom through change is where we find out who really wants to be free. Because when it comes down to the first three things of admitting, believing, trusting, and then confessing, there's not a whole lot of functional changes in your life that have to take place. There's not a whole lot of things that you're required to give up. But when we get to this point of change, it will begin to cost you something. And many people, as we will see as we walk through this, will count the cost and find that they don't believe that it's worth it. And the end of that road of you counting the cost and not being willing to let go of some things that are keeping you from finding freedom is only death. And so our prayer this morning is that as we look at this, that you would see the benefits of change, of the true and lasting freedom that comes from it, and you would make that decision. And so we're going to look at three things this morning that have to change, how you have to change the direction in your life, how you have to change who is in charge, and then how you have to change the power that you rely on. So let me pray for that, and we'll continue to dive in. Father, we thank you for your grace, that you saved us, not just for forgiveness, but for freedom, and a freedom that can only be found in Jesus Christ. God, we, we admit that we fall in love with our sin, that we get more comfortable with our old way of life, and because of those things, we are at times unwilling to make the changes necessary to walk in the freedom that Christ has provided for us. 
So God, we pray as we look again at your truth this morning that you would help us to see that true and lasting change, true and lasting freedom only comes through making necessary changes in our life and would your spirit empower us to walk in those things. We love you and we thank you. It is in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, let's look in Galatians chapter five. The book of Galatians is a book that's all about freedom. It's about freedom really from, from two things. It's about freedom from having to earn salvation through works, that you have to do good things in order to earn your salvation, in order to earn God's favor. Galatians is a book about being free from having to earn your, your salvation. But it's also a book about being set free from having to walk in captivity to the sinful desires that live within you. It's in both of these. And in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul, who wrote Galatians, starts to get to this point. And so in Galatians 5, starting in verses 1 through 5, he begins to talk about freedom from having to earn God's favor, freedom from having to earn our salvation. And he says this, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Amen? Amen. And he says, therefore, because you are free, stand firm in that freedom and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. The yoke of slavery being this need that you have to obey the law of God in order to earn salvation from God. Do not go back to being subject to that yoke. And he says, behold, I, Paul, which is who wrote the letter, one of the apostles, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. So that may be a little confusing to you. So let me simplify it. What he's saying is, if you make the conscious decision to earn God's favor, to earn your own righteousness before God, you are obligated in order to do that, to keep the entire law of God perfectly. It's the only way to earn your own righteousness and your own salvation before God. And the Bible would say there's bad news there. You can't do that. You can't earn your salvation. And so don't take on again this yoke of slavery to the law that you've been set free from. He says, if you do that, you've been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now we know and we believe that once you come to faith in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, even if in a momentary way you go back to feeling like you have to earn God's favor, you don't lose your salvation, but what you do lose is the joy that comes from being set free from the penalty of sin. That's what Paul is talking about here. He says, do not go back to that. And then he says, for we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. He's saying that we have been born again by the work of the Spirit in our lives because of our faith in Jesus. It's our faith that saves us, not our works. And so in summary of this, what Paul is saying is do not forsake your freedom to go back to trying to earn your salvation. This would be the sin of legalism, of saying that our good works are what earn our favor with God. Do not go back into that. And I think everyone in, in this room would say, amen to that. We're free from that law. But then he's actually going to go on and say something else in that, but, but you're not necessarily free from the law, which is free to walk in obedience to God. And later on in that chapter in verse 13, he talks about how we're free from something else. And what he talks about how we're free from is we're free from having to serve our flesh and our sin that we were once held captive to. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, he says this, for you were called to freedom, brethren, brothers and sisters. And then here it is. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Don't use the freedom from the penalty of sin that you've received in Christ, don't use the freedom that Christ has given you to overcome the power in your, of sin in your life just to turn right back around and go back into prison, into the slavery of sin that exists in your life. And he says, but instead, through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So in summary of that, he says, do not use your freedom to choose to serve your flesh in sin. 
change the direction of your life. You've been set free. Now don't go back and live the same way in the same destructive and sinful habits that you did before Christ set you free. Make a change. Change the way that you live and walk in the freedom that Christ has accomplished to you. And so the first point this morning is this, to break free, you must change directions. To have any hope of having freedom, you must change the direction of your life or else you will remain imprisoned to your sin. So just as an example of that, I wanna review a bit of the Christian life with you this morning to, to just illustrate this point. And the, the illustration or the image of the Christian life is that we don't start off as Christians. No one in this room was born a Christian. Everyone in this room was born dead in their sins and, dress, and transgressions. The Bible would say that for those who are apart from Christ, that we are actually held captive to our sins. It's the picture that, that we are imprisoned. That sin that exists in our life, everything that causes brokenness, our selfishness, our jealousy, our fear, our racism, our lust, our laziness, our judging of others, our pride, our greed, our manipulation, all of these things, they're causing destruction in our life. They're causing destruction in your life. And apart from Christ, there's no way out. If you're here this morning and you haven't received salvation in Christ, if you haven't believed that he is the son of God in the flesh, and if you haven't placed your faith in him, you are dead and you are bound forever to be enslaved to your sin. There is no way out. But God made a way. God made a way through Christ on the cross where he took what we deserve, the payment that we deserve for all of the sin that we've lived in our life to be set free. And when we look at Jesus on the cross and has he paid for the penalty for all those things and we say, God, I admit that I am a sinner, that I have rebelled against you. And I know that I stand and I deserve condemnation. I deserve to be separated you, from you, but, but I believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh who paid for my sins on that cross. And I place my faith in him as my savior. Something amazing happens. The penalty for sin is paid and Jesus opens the door and makes a way for you to be free and for you to walk into freedom. Amen? But then here's the, what, the normative thing that happens in the Christian life. We get so used, we, we've made a lifetime of a habit of spending our life in sin, we get so used to that pattern in our life that we, we take our eyes off of Jesus, the one who set us free. The first time that hardship comes in our life, the first time that we feel dissatisfied with life, the first time that we feel overcome by the, by the burdens or the circumstances that we find ourselves in, the first time that we find ourselves despairing or discouraged, we take our eyes off of Jesus and we begin to look back at our old way of life and all, and all the insufficient ways that we would cope and we take our eyes off of Jesus and we don't change. Even though he's set us free, we don't change our pattern of life and we walk right back into the prison of sin. And we live here, but there's a difference. There's a difference between those who are in prison to their sin who are in Christ and those who are out of Christ. And the difference is, if you are in Christ, if you've received him as your savior, the reason that you're living underneath the power of and in the pain of sin is because you're choosing to. The door is open. You don't have to live here. The only reason you're living here is because you're choosing to live here. And so the Bible talks about how we, how we move out as believers from underneath the power and pain of sin in our life is we turn our focus off of our old way of life, off of our sin, and we fix our eyes on Jesus and we pursue him. And it's not just about trying not to sin, it's about pursuing Christ. And when we keep our eyes on him and we pursue him, the outcome of that is lasting freedom. Amen? But whenever we take our eyes off, we go back into our old way of life. Biblically, this is called repentance. If you want lasting freedom, 
from the power and pain of sin in your life. What must come after your confession is repentance. It's functionally changing the way you think, what you believe, and the way that you act so that you can walk in that freedom. And it's not just about trying not to sin. It's about pursuing something new altogether. We change. Our lives change when we become entirely ready to turn away from our patterns of sin and turn to God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 illustrates it this way. It says this, Now flee from youthful lust. Turn your back on the things that once you were imprisoned to and run and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. With those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, you change who you're running with. You find other people who are pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace, and you run with them to pursue the Lord. And when you run to God, you leave your sin behind. It's repentance. But if you don't turn from your old patterns of life and turn to Christ, you will remain in prison to your sin even though you are in Christ. Yes, it doesn't change the fact that you're set free from its penalty, but you will continue to experience the destruction of that sin in your life until you turn from it. You see, repentance goes hand in hand with confession for finding healing and freedom. Confession is for healing from the damage and pain of sin. Repentance is for finding lasting freedom from its power and its presence in your life. And sometimes, and many of you would have had this experience, we experience a season of healing from the pain of sin because of our confession. But you've never fully escaped its power. It still is reigning over your life because you haven't made the necessary changes to turn from it and to turn and to pursue God, you keep living the same way and expecting different results. And do you know what that's called? Lunacy. You're crazy. We're crazy. We're all crazy. Because we all at times make that choice. We use our freedom to choose to walk back into our old pattern of life and to remain underneath the power of sin. True repentance, making true changes, is what will lead to you breaking free from the power and pain of sin in your life. Well, like, how do you do that functionally? Come on Monday night to Regen, and we'll disciple you further in that. But just to briefly give you a picture of it, one of my favorite verses to look at in this is Romans chapter 13, verse 14, which says this, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for your flesh in regards to its lust. Which means this, that As you turn from your sin and you begin to pursue a relationship with Christ as your Savior and your Lord, as you learn how to grow in that relationship, as you're connected to his body, as you spend time in the word, as you spend time in prayer, you also do something else. You make provision in your life that your triggers, those things that come up in your life that tempt you to turn around and go back into your old way, you you make provision. You don't make any provision for those things to exist in your life. You cut them out. Which means, if there's a group of people, friends, who you're running with, that tend to be triggers for you when you start to spend time with them, you tend to overdrink, or you tend to let your language slip into things that are unedifying, that tend to make you more contentious in your spirit, make no provision for your flesh. And at least for a season, you may need to cut those friends out of your life. Because they are a trigger to send you back into your own pattern. And you may be saying, well, i got to reach them. I'm a missionary. That is true. But I think you're, a lot of times you're um, confusing yourself what you're actually doing. Because you're commingling with their sin. You're not, you're not reaching them as a missionary. And so you may need time to mature in your faith before you start spending the same kind of time around them. Or it may be that... Uh, there's a circumstance that's a trigger for you to go back into sin. Like when you find yourself alone with technology. When you're alone with technology and you've had a hard week, when you're feeling burdened by things and you need some means of fantasy to escape. And in those moments, you're triggered to use technology to view vain images. 
And it's a trigger for you to go back into sin. And so you may need to make, make the decision to make no provision for you to have access to technology when you're alone, which may mean you need a dumb phone, <laughs> not a smartphone. And I know like there's a lot of you in here who think that's crazy. I know men who have done it and who have never regretted it. And they've got the little Nokia and they can play snake on it. And that's about it, you know? <laughs> And some of the kids in the room have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you struggle with control and anger, it may mean that you need to invite people into your life who have the spirit of God in them to say, hey, when you, when you see me beginning to control something that's beyond my ability to control, or when you see me welling up in anger to try to uh, to respond in ways to things that are unholy. I'm giving you permission to be a roadblock and to step in and point out the direction that I'm beginning to turn and to point me back to the Lord. And so you begin to put on the Lord Christ and make no provision. All of your circumstances are different. To be discipled in that, come to Regen tomorrow night and let us help you. But to break free, you must change directions. You can't Live the way you live before Christ and expect to find lasting freedom. You must change directions. And then secondly, to break free, you must change who is in charge. To break free, you must change who is in charge. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This is a verse that we've talked about, I think, in the previous two weeks, uh, but deserves a little bit more time here. Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. This is worth some explanation. We could read right past that and not catch what Jesus is doing. In, in Roman law, one of the things that the authorities in Rome would do to people who were being crucified is that they would make them carry the actual cross that they were going to be crucified on to the place of their crucifixion. They made Jesus do this, and the reason is is that the Roman authorities wanted to force every person who was being crucified to visibly show that they were coming underneath the authority of Rome. That Rome is in rule and Rome is right. Now we know that Jesus was not a criminal. Jesus was perfect. He was sinless, but he became sin and paid the penalty for sin for us. But Jesus is taking that imagery of a criminal carrying their cross to show this idea of subjection, submission, surrender to authority. And what Jesus says, if you want to follow me to freedom, you must come underneath and be subject to and surrender to my authority in your life. You have received me as Savior, but in order to find freedom, lasting freedom, you must also receive me as Lord, there is no other way. And he says in here also something that we must pay attention to is that this decision, this choice to surrender to Christ and to put him in charge is not a one-time choice, but a daily choice that we all must make. It says that we must take up our cross daily and follow him. And so to break free, you have to wave the white flag and surrender control of your life to Jesus. You don't get to call the shots anymore. You have to follow him and follow his plan. But here's the reality. It's hard. It's hard to let go of the control of our lives. Am I right? But why? Why is it so hard for us to change who is in charge and surrender control to Christ? Well, the first reason is this. It's because we're all experts at sin. We're experts at it. Think about it. We all have spent a lifetime in training to live sinfully, to live out patterns of sin in our life. There's a well-worn path back into our sin. Um, my wife and I have three dogs. Don't judge us. We have three dogs. And every time we let them out of the kennel, they're in the garage. Um, they used to be in the side. And then we had kids. Now they're in the garage where they sleep. And uh, when we let them out of the kennel, we open up the back door. They run through the house. And they always take the same path. They run diagonally across our backyard, and then they run the perimeter. And because of that, you know what's there? Dirt. Like, there's no grass. Because they do that every single day, they've developed a pattern. They've developed a habit. They've developed a rhythm. And you know what? So have you. 
And before Christ, that pattern in your life was always to live in sin, to live underneath the control of selfishness and fear and vanity and all of these other things you've made a habit of. And because of that, you kind of have grown to love your sin and learn, love your pattern of life. And the reason that you don't want to surrender control to Jesus and choose to make him in charge, in charge is because you would have to let go of all that. But when you make that choice to, to love your sin more than choosing to surrender to the Lord, you walk right back into prison. And how you doing? How's that going for you? It never ends. Well, the second reason that it's so hard to put Jesus in charge is because we think the cost for freedom is too great or that the change would be too expensive or it would maybe just simply be too uncomfortable. You see, when we come to be in Christ, when we're born again, God gives all of us new loves to pursue in this life, new comforts, new goals, a new security, a new identity. But in order to walk in those things, it requires that we change. That we change to follow Jesus' way of life and not our own, but we've grown really familiar with our pattern of sin and the thought of leaving that for the unfamiliar path of Jesus' plan is really scary. And so the reason that we don't choose to put Jesus in, in charge is because we decide that we would rather live in the familiarity of our sinful life than surrender our lives to Jesus' unfamiliar plan. And when you do that, you walk right back into the prison of your sin. How's that going for you? You must choose to put Jesus in charge. And then lastly, the reason that we don't is because we fear that God won't come through, that Jesus won't come through. We don't trust him. We're afraid that Jesus does not have the best plan, or we believe that his plan would be robbing us of something that we love, or we believe that he isn't powerful enough to help us make the changes, or we believe that he's not power enough to heal the wounds that we have because of the way other people's sin have affected us. We believe that he's not powerful enough to provide the comfort that we need. And so we don't change. We don't put him in charge. And when we do that and we stay in control of our lives, we walk right back into the prison of sin. How's that going for you? Surely, whatever the cost is to be paid to surrender control of your life and give it to Jesus is worth the cost. Because at the end of that road, and only the road of having him in charge of your life, is freedom. You only break free when you change who is in charge. And then lastly, the third point this morning, the third thing that has to change is the power that we rely on. To break free, you must choose to change the power that you rely on. For honest, many of us leave behind the power of Christ that saves us to try to live life in our own power and in our own way. But to break free you must humbly ask God's spirit to change your heart and mind to follow Jesus fully. You ask for his help. You depend on his help. And it's God's spirit that transform us, transforms us from the inside out. So how does God actually bring about that change? We've already talked about how Jesus' perfect sacrifice on the cross paid the penalty for our sins. He sets us free from that penalty by his work alone. But something else happens at the cross. We are given Christ righteousness. We are adopted as God's children. And then God's spirit comes to live in us to supernaturally free us from the power of sin and to conform our hearts and our minds to Jesus. Well, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, in short, is a member of the Trinity. He is one, in essence, with the Father, but he is distinct in his personhood. He has a mind, a will, and emotions. And his work is to work in Christians first to regenerate new life in us, to give us those new desires, that, that new identity, that new purpose. And then he also helps us. He guides us into truth. He gives us spiritual gifts. He makes us holy. He produces spiritual fruit in our lives and he produces worship. The Holy Spirit is Christ in us and he is in us indwelling us fully at the moment of our salvation, and he is fully available to be able to start working and changing us from the inside out when we choose to walk by the Spirit. 
You see, a believer can choose to walk by the Spirit or to quench the Spirit. The power for him to change us is available all the time, but it it requires our participation with him. Let's go back over into Galatians 5, verses 16 through 26. Paul continues from talking about the freedom and how we should use it to the choice that we make with that freedom on what power we rely on to live the Christian life. He says this, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that please you, which means in Christ, until he comes again, there are competing desires and competing natures within us, the nature of our flesh and the nature of God's spirit. He says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law, meaning this, that if you use your freedom to walk in obedience to God, to follow the leading of the spirit, you're doing it out of a response to his love, not because you were trying to earn his love. You're not obligated to follow the law to earn your salvation. You follow the law out of a love for God and a response to him. And then it says, but if you essentially, if you choose to live by the flesh, the deeds are evident. If you choose to try to find freedom from sin in your life under your own power, this is what's evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, because the list could go on, which means if yours wasn't listed, it's still in here, and other things like these. (laughs) Paul says that he warned them about this, and that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says, if those people are walking by the Spirit, What becomes evident in their life because they're depending on the Spirit is this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. They don't choose to walk by it. But instead, they live by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So in summary... With your freedom, you must choose which power you will walk by or you will live by, the flesh or the spirit. Walking by the flesh leads back into the prison of your sin. Walking by the spirit leads into freedom, lasting freedom in Christ. And so, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you break free by choosing to walk by the spirit? The Holy Spirit um, guides and directs us into God's truth. He, he, he leads us to walk in the ways that God has ordained that we walk in freedom, that we grow in becoming more and more like Christ. Essentially, the Holy Spirit works through our relationship with God and our relationship with others, others being both those in the church and those outside of the church. There's an amazing ministry called the Navigators that has packaged what it means to walk by the Spirit, to walk in God's truth, in the pathways through which the Spirit works into a, a, an image that they call the will. And the will illustrates the obedient Christian life. The obedient Christian life, walking with God in a relationship, leads to, if, if someone is following Jesus, is following the Lord, they will walk in these ways with God. And in doing so, They will be walking and unleashing the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. It talks about our vertical relationship with God. It starts with Jesus at the center of making the choice to have him be in charge. And then it talks about how we spend time in prayer and in the word, growing our relationship with God. Then it talks about fellowship, which specifically refers to belonging to the church and being in community with other people who have God's spirit, through which the spirit of God works through. And then it talks about witnessing, participating with God in his mission for reaching a lost world. And when we follow Christ to live in these ways, we turn our back on our sin and are obedient to Christ in these ways, it leads to lasting freedom. So functionally, what does that look like in your life? When is the last time 
that the temptation to sin came, whether it was to look at something or to respond in a certain way or to hold a grudge or to be overcome by grief. When was the last time for you that that temptation came and the very first thing you did was pray? You see, to access the power of the Holy Spirit in your life when, when temptation comes, to overcome that temptation is to pray. It's to say, God, I can't do this on my own. I've tried so many times, and I'm too weak. So God, will you help me? Will you give me the power to trust you and to walk with you and not walk into my sin, to not be overcome by anxiety, to not be filled with anger, to not give in to looking at those images? Will you help me? And as we pray and we show our dependence on God, God provides us the power to overcome through his spirit. And then was the last time that after you prayed, you just, in a moment of temptation, opened up God's word. You see, God's word is where we hear God speak. And if the Holy Spirit works through our relationship with God, one of the first things we should do when temptation comes is look to hear God speak. And we open up the Bible and we look for guidance and we look for counsel and we look for strength through God's word. And so we rely on God's power on the power of the spirit when we go to God's word in time of need the other thing that happens is when we run to other people in the church for help when temptation comes when you're struggling and you reach out to other believers and you say hey I'm struggling here and I can't do this on my own I need you to help me I'm tempted now to disbelieve God's truth in these ways. I'm tempted to believe that in order to deal with my anxiety, it's better for me uh, to be able to sleep just to get drunk tonight and go to sleep and go to bed. Like that, that's what I need to do. That's what I'm tempted to believe. Will you remind me what's true about the Lord and how I run to him? And so you follow the Lord Jesus Christ into relying on God's people through which the spirit of God will work. And then lastly, When's the last time when you were struggling that you decided to quit looking at yourself? You see, all of our sin starts with a look at ourselves and when we become infatuated with ourselves and, and our unmet needs and our desires and our temptations and our struggles. But one of the ways that the Spirit wants to lead you into lasting freedom is to lead you to participate with God in his mission because when you're focused on reaching other people for Christ, you know what you're not focused on? Your sin in your struggles. And so the path to breaking free is choosing, through which the Holy Spirit's gonna work, is choosing to make Jesus the Lord of your life, to turn into God's word and turning to him in prayer when your time of need comes by reaching out to other believers who have the spirit of God in them to come alongside you, to help you, and then by quit focusing on your struggles and focus on reaching other people. And the moment that you disconnect from any of those five things, you disconnect from the power of the spirit and you walk right back into the prison of your sin. How's that going for you? The way out is the obedient Christian life. And just so you can see that None of this is my idea. I think there's another slide that just shows where all this comes from, straight out of God's word. This is God's plan. This is the path of Christ to freedom in your life. Do you want it? Do you want it? And so, are you ready to make the changes necessary in your life to break free? If so, you need to change directions to no longer focus on not pursuing your sin, but start pursuing God altogether. You need to change who is in charge, surrender your life to the lordship of Jesus on a daily basis, and then you need to change the power that you live by, that you rely on and walk by the Spirit. To end today, I want to give you the opportunity to hear from a member of our church family who's made these choices, and her name is Erin Duran. If you would welcome me, welcome with me, Erin, to the stage. Hello, can you hear me? Great. Um, well, hey, my name is Erin. I have a new life in Christ, and I'm recovering from fear of man and codependency. Hi, Erin. Hey, y'all. Um, 
As a child, I believe that God gave up his son Jesus to die in my place and pay for my sin. There was nothing I could do to earn salvation and because of Jesus, I was forgiven. But I grew up to view the Bible as rules to be followed to avoid consequences from my parents. I didn't see God as a father who cared about me and nothing around me showed me God should matter to me in my daily life. I had fears of being alone and because I was too because I was too tall and not pretty enough and believed I was easily overlooked, so I ran after popularity through athletics and alcohol. I needed everyone to like me so that I could like me. I went to college, got married, had two kids. I had achievements and a place in ministry, but had fears of being exposed because I hid from church staff and friends what I did with other friends. I had a marriage image to maintain, so I enabled seven years of dysfunction, immorality, and deceit even while leading a church group for married couples at the very same time. I resented my husband and belittled him endlessly. After his affairs came to light, I sought counsel in isolation and divorce was my ticket out of difficulty. Betrayal shattered my life and I was hurting and angry. I wanted apologies I never got and I wanted a front row seat to the public humiliation of everyone who hurt me. I would not take my eyes off my circumstances and unable to cope, I slept through the next two years of my life to avoid my pain. Eventually, I got out of bed, got a job, and got attention from men. This was intoxicating, so I consumed myself in the bar scene and online dating apps. I pursued immorality with men to escape reality and numb myself with what felt fun. When I was down again, I'd go find another fun distraction. I lied about everything to everyone, and I could not have cared less because binging on the sugar-coated garbage of my own feelings was all that mattered. Eventually, I met someone whose attention I loved. Barely knowing him, I buried red flags and got married. I knew the Bible said not to be unequally yoked, and I knew that he did not know Jesus as his savior, but I did it anyway because I loved the momentary feelings of my sin. Feelings that evaporated when our honeymoon exploded in rage. I tried to please him to avoid his violence. I needed help and I needed change, but everything only got worse. Until I asked for help and God turned to me and heard my cry. I showed up at Watermark. I showed up. (laughs) Yeah. I showed up at Watermark on January 3rd, 2017, right after moving my house with my kids because of physical abuse in my marriage. I went to Regeneration, Watermark's recovery ministry, drowning in shame and only shared vague things because I didn't want people to think that I was the jacked up girl with a messed up life. I hid the truth, convinced that isolation was the safest place to be. I felt stupid and I wanted another divorce to erase this man from my life, but I was afraid of what people would think when they heard I was divorced again. Divorce number two, and this time after being married for only six months. I hated my life, and I hated me most of all. Weeks later, I realized I was pregnant. A baby was coming that I didn't want from a man in marriage I wished had never happened, and I was afraid of what people would think. I showed up to Regen that following Monday, acting fine but falling apart inside. As women shared around the circle, I knew I was about to tell the truth. I erupted in ugly but honest tears to women I didn't even know. I told them everything about my circumstances and I confessed my judgmental attitude towards others. I couldn't believe I was saying everything out loud but I was done pretending. I expected those women to be disgusted and avoid me But without hesitation, they offered me acceptance, friendship, and even their phone numbers. They chose to love me and I hadn't done anything to earn it. Y'all, that changed everything. I had spent 35 years trying to be better with no real heart change or freedom, always judging others while falling back into the same destructive patterns. God used Regen to show me how my sinful patterns of worshiping people's approval My idol of an easy life and codependency were destroying me. I used others to meet my own emotional needs in a way that harmed us both. I was broken, expecting broken people to fix me with their broken love. 
This caused bondage in my heart and chaos in my life. I learned that people are only people. They cannot satisfy you, even if their promises or online profiles say so. Instead, he showed me he is the only one who can satisfy me. Repentance or turning from my sin is when I choose to replace my old sinful patterns and coping mechanisms with the truth of God's word. Instead of picking up my phone to the next person I wanted to fix me, I picked up my Bible to remind myself God's goodness is fully satisfying. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, freely give us everything else? My life of freedom has already been purchased, and he is everything that I need. God taught me that my limitations do not limit him, and his spirit began to change my heart and mind to follow him fully. As I continually examine my life, when I sin, I confess early and often so that I can follow Christ with my whole heart. My feelings no longer control me, and I choose to bring my sin out into the open so that I can be healed and set free. Every single step of regeneration was critical as I daily devoted to reading God's word and found satisfaction in his goodness. I overcame nothing but was rescued from everything. I must examine my life every day and confess my hidden, hidden thoughts to others because when I fret, it leads only to evil and the sin of seeking attention and human approval. Psalm 116.7 says, Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. I must trust Christ again and again, regardless of my feelings, so that I don't go back to something that God has already rescued me from. With the biblical view of marriage and God's calling to be a minister of reconciliation, God's word, alongside the wise counsel of God's people, has guided my efforts to reconcile while maintaining wise boundaries for our safety. Difficulty remains as my husband chooses to file for divorce and go his own way. Yet I know that my circumstances don't befind me and by God's grace, I am what I am. God doesn't promise to erase my temptation to follow my feelings, but Psalm 34, 18 does promise that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, so I don't have to wish for an easy life. He is with me and provides for me and the three children he gave me no matter what. When I'm tempted to fear that my past has already wrecked my kids' futures, I must trust again that his perfect plans for them because he is everything that they need. I don't have to wish for easy lives for them either, but pray above all else that they would know and trust the Lord with their daily lives. Today, I no longer see God's word as rules to be followed, but as truth to guide my whole life. Obedience to him is where life and peace are found, and his love for me has changed everything, and I'm no longer a slave to my feelings. Amen. <laughs> if I could tell you one thing, it would be there is real love to be found, and Jesus is it. He's better than anything you can make happen for yourself, and he never fails to love you more than you know. My name is Aaron. I have a new life in Christ, and I'm in recovery from fear of man and codependency. Thanks for letting me share, guys. God is good, and it was for freedom that he set you free. Will you follow him into that freedom? And if your answer to that is yes, it involves making Jesus the Lord of your life, choosing to make the changes that he directs you to and relying on the Spirit to make those changes. If you're on the verge of whether or not to begin that path, and that you're um, a little bit hesitant maybe to come down front after service and talk to some people who have walked that path, which we would love for you to do that. We are here waiting after service. We want you to know, like, if you show up tomorrow night into this room, you're just showing up with a bunch of other broken people. And we're all at different paths along the road of our journey towards that freedom. And, and our greatest desire is to invite you into that journey, to come alongside you. You will not be shamed. You will not be condemned. You will be encouraged and strengthened to turn from your sin. Anything from self-righteousness to adultery to murder to everything in between, 
and just trust God and follow him. It would be our delight to welcome you here on Monday night. If your marriage is in a rough spot, Wednesday nights is a very similar ministry called Reengage, where you can jump in and work on those things together. And if you're in community, go to him this afternoon. But freedom is waiting for you if you'll choose to follow him. So let me pray and then we'll end by responding in worship through song. Father, we thank you for your grace. And that to your great delight, you've given us your spirit to empower us to follow you, to turn from our sin and to follow you. And so God, I, I pray that, that you would help us to get over our pride, to get, to get over our um, unwillingness to declare our weakness, to help us get over our fear to confess and that you would move us out of the prison of our sin each and every day to follow you and walk in the freedom that you offer us. God, we need you. Will you help us? Amen.